I'm reading from Mark chapter 5, and I begin with verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garment, I will get well immediately. The flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any more? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the, the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing, and entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he said that something should be given her to eat. We are on a year-long journey through the pages of the New Testament, and along the way we will take some time to also journey through the hymnal of the ancient Jews and the New Testament followers of the way, the Psalter. There are notable points of crossing on this journey. Some crossings are much more imaginary than real. The verse and chapter divisions we find in our Bibles were not there in the original manuscripts, and so it is not at all helpful for us to make much of crossing from one verse to another or from one chapter to the next. The crossing we make today from the first evangelist, Matthew, to the second, John Mark, merits at least some comment. Both were Jews, unlike Luke the Greek, but Matthew and Mark wrote with different readers in mind. Matthew takes pains to repeatedly reference the Old Testament prophecies which Jesus' birth, life, and death clearly fulfilled. Matthew seeks to help the Jewish unbeliever to believe and realize that the long-awaited one has come. 
and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And his name is Jesus, meaning salvation. Mark's original target audience was the no-nonsense Roman reader who was likely, unlikely, to bear patiently a lengthy discourse. As we cross out of Matthew and into Mark, the goal of holding forth Jesus as the unparalleled Son of God who became the Son of Man that he might redeem us is the same. However, as we start to read from John Mark's pen, what many from earliest times have actually thought came from Peter's preaching, it is as though we have been grasped by the hand and we are hastily being led through the life of the master. Mark moves us directly into the adult ministry of John the Baptist and the introduction of Jesus as he is baptized at the Jordan River. Following that, we are given very succinct glimpses of the various events in the ministry of Jesus. The rapid motion is highlighted by Mark's frequent use of the word immediately. The longer teaching passages we found in Matthew's account are either absent or abbreviated by Mark. But yet, what treasure we find in these 16 fast-moving chapters. But in coming to the account of Mark chapter 5, we find a problem. For the preacher who has just laid down the rule that Mark always writes in this swift way, a serving of humble pie is in order. What I read, read for you, what I read for you from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43, when laid side by side with how this is recorded by Mark in chapter 9 and by Luke in chapter 8, we see that Mark gives us the fullest account of these miracles, the one enveloped within the other, or as I have titled this message, a miracle en route to a miracle. If you are ever in a battle of wits with someone over Bible knowledge, ask them if they know where the lost chapter of the Bible is. The answer is that it is found in Luke chapter 15, where Jesus tells of three things that have been lost but were found and which caused great joy. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Mark chapter 5, in a similar way, tells of three impossible situations, but it also shows the power of God revealed in the Son of God, for nothing shall be impossible with God, to overcome the impossible. Three impossibilities. The first has to do with a man going by the name Legion, who dwelt among the tombs, who could not be held by the strongest chain, and who could best any contender. A genuinely hopeless case. But Jesus comes, and the formerly naked, demon-possessed man is now wearing clothes, is in his right mind, no longer the wild man, and becomes a powerful witness of what great things Jesus had done for him among the ten Greek cities called the Decapolis. The second impossibility was to do with a woman who had done the rounds of the medical professionals of her day, spent all that she had, and was none the better, but rather worse for all her effort. And this had been going on for 12 years. The third impossibility was to do with a beloved daughter, a pre-teenage girl who had been alive the exact number of years as the other woman had suffered from her unresolvable bleeding condition. 
The impossibility was that the girl, who was very ill when we first meet her desperate father, is announced dead when Jesus turns his full attention towards the synagogue official's home. It is very instructive for us to see how that both men and women, the young and the not so young, were blessed by Jesus. Those who had a problem of long standing and those who were suddenly set upon by the immense difficulties of life, each received of his gracious hand. As the account of the former demoniac draws to a conclusion, the emphasis is upon the amazement which settles upon the people who hear of Jesus' mighty power. It must have been quite a boat ride across the Sea of Galilee as the disciples recounted again and again the event which they had just parted from. Did you see the look on their faces? But touching the shore, it seemed like just a few moments before the large crowds gathered once again around Jesus. One man determinately pushes his way through the pack to speak to Jesus. As a local synagogue official, undoubtedly many in the crowd would have recognized Jairus. He pleads that Jesus would come for he is confident that Jesus would be able to heal his dear daughter who is at the point of death. Jesus, with the large, large crowd stuck to him like a tongue on a frosty flagpole, heads off with Jairus. But in that crowd was another need, not a disinterested bystander, not someone curiously along for a leisurely stroll, a broken body, which contained a soul that was equally sure Jesus was the answer to her need. See the faith of this anonymous woman. I don't need to talk to him. I don't even need a moment of his time. If I just touch his garments, I will be well. Jairus came to Jesus in the sight of all. The woman wanted to be unseen and unknown. Jairus asked for another, his little girl. The woman sought for herself. Jairus had no trouble imposing on Jesus' time and energy for the journey. The woman sought no intrusion. It would seem Jairus' daughter's problem was of possibly recent onset. The woman had suffered for 12 long years. We are not told that Jairus had been diminished financially by his daughter's condition. The woman had lost all. Jairus said, if you come, if you lay your hands on my girl, all will be well. The woman believed, if I just touch his garment, I will be well. I do not mean to praise the one or to chastise the other. I simply want you to see that here are two very different people approaching Jesus and two very different people for whom Jesus so graciously met the need, the need that seemed to be utterly impossible, utterly impossible. What is your burden? Is it for you or are you heartbroken for another? I would want to declare to you, Jesus is the great workman who does all things well. In verses 28 
or rather, in verses 29 and 30, we run smack into the word immediately, twice. The woman, upon sneakily reaching past another and touching Jesus' garment, immediately knew that something had happened. Something that she had looked and longed and hoped for for 12 years. But Jesus also immediately, at the very same moment, sensed that something had happened within him. It was like Jesus had been watching an amperage gauge and he had seen the little needle twitch. Jesus knew that power, power had proceeded from him. It wasn't that there had been an inappropriate touching of skin on skin. Jesus, perceiving in himself, we read, where did it go? The woman wanted to slink away. Jairus surely wanted to keep going. The disciples could hardly believe Jesus would even ask, who touched my garments, knowing how many people were jostling so close that everyone was bumping into each other constantly? How can you ask that, Jesus? Don't you see what's going on around you? Haven't you felt the bumping? The woman, we never do learn her name, comes fearful and trembling before Jesus and spills the beans about it all. Jesus would not have this woman to think that God is stingy, miserly, or parsimonious. Jesus says to her, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in this way. Go not fearful or trembling, thinking that you have stolen of God's power, that you have sneakily taken something that he was wanting to cling to himself. Go in this way. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. This woman got two for one that day. She received healing, and she would have gone home dancing and shouting for joy if that was all she received. But Jesus would speak to fearful and trembling hearts as well of peace that passes all understanding. Go not fearful, go not trembling, go not wondering if something is going to catch up with you, but rather go in peace, go in peace. But here comes word from Jairus' house that Jesus is no longer needed. The professional mourners have been called. The time for a healing and a healer is past. But Jesus, on overhearing what was being said, speaks peace to this troubled heart as well. I'm sure that Jairus sensed a dagger of grief that struck his heart. Oh, if only that woman hadn't held us back. If only this crowd had not been so pressing in. If only we had made quicker progress. Maybe, maybe, maybe all of these things surely came flooding into his heart as he heard the heavy news. His precious little 12-year-old girl was dead and that, in, that all of his hopes had been dashed, all of them dashed. Here is one of the times Jesus gives special privilege to three inner disciples within the group of the 12 disciples who journeyed with Jesus. Jesus, he takes these three closest disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. We're never told exactly why these three had such privilege or 
that why even Andrew, Peter's brother, was left out. Why not an inner four? But Jesus, as at other times, he takes these three with him. They arrive, and what a commotion is in full play. Jesus tells these people, he thinks, they are silly because the girl is not dead but asleep. The response of laughter declares that they think Jesus is a kook. He's out of his mind. They know the difference between sleep and death. And the girl, plain as day to them, is not asleep. But she has crossed over that great divide. And regrettably, she is dead. And that's why they are making such a commotion. Jesus, he goes into the room where the little girl is with only Peter, James, John, Jairus, and Jairus' wife. And he speaks simply, but what power there is in the declaration of Jesus. He speaks Talitha Kum, which Mark tells us for the benefit of those who didn't understand the Aramaic, those Romans. He says, this means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And two things happened, both immediately, without delay, immediately. Mark's key word he uses so many times. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk. The power of God had bested death, even as it had bested legion there in the Gerizines. That man who had not been able to have been bound with even a strong chain, and no one was able to restrain that wild man, utterly wild. And the problem of that anonymous woman 12 years suffering so much, having impoverished herself, seeking a cure for her malady. Here the little girl hears the words of God's power, of God's voice, and she gets up and walks around. And that other thing that happened immediately, immediately, they were completely astounded, completely astounded. A miracle en route to a miracle, a miracle enveloped by another miracle, the power of God in these three lives, in Legion, that anonymous woman, and in Jairus's house that day so long ago. The power of God is not diminished today. The power of God yet stands, and nothing shall be impossible with God. When you pray, when you call upon the name of the Lord, I would want you to know that you are addressing the highest court and that heaven hears your humble prayer. Why do we have the miracles recorded of Jesus' life? The apostle John, as he would write his account, he would hold forth especially seven sign miracles which describe to us the various ways in which Jesus met the needs of the people of his day. And he writes, these were written, these were recorded, these are being recounted for you now that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Jesus would yet want to speak life. He would want to speak peace. He would want you to know that all power in heaven and on earth is in his hands and that we can never ask too much. Jesus didn't have to go to Jairus' house and wave his hands and do all kinds of different things. Jesus just needed to speak the word from where he was. But Jesus went with Jairus. Jesus met that woman. Jesus cared for each and every one, heartbroken, torn, 
fractured, devastated by sin in its various forms, Jesus is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever, always the same. You can come to him and know of his mighty power. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word, and we give you thanks that it indeed speaks with a mighty power. So I ask for each one who hears this message that they would understand of your love and of your tender mercy, of your gracious provision for us all. We would come and we would ask of your bounty. We realize that though power went out of you so long ago, into that woman's body to heal her. Yet it was not you were diminished in your power. The power was still there to do a mighty miracle of raising Jairus' daughter from death. We cannot ask too largely of you. And Lord, sometimes it feels like we are so undone. There are so many impossibilities in our lives in our situations, in our families, in our workplaces, schools, communities, and nations. But Lord, we give you thanks that you are the great and the mighty God. There is none to compare with you, and we exalt you. We would lay our very lives before you and declare, great is our God. So Lord, I pray for men and women who are looking to you now, that they would entrust themselves to you and to you alone and call upon you for your salvation and for your mighty work. And those things which are so heavy upon their hearts, may they bring them before you and say, Lord, here it is. I lay it before you. And may your gracious response come to each heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.